Thanks for staying with us. Authorities in northern Burkina Faso say at least 29 people have been killed in two separate attacks by alleged militants. The government says at least 15 people were killed when a truck drove over an explosive device in San Mantenga province. And according to security officials, most of those on board were traders. The other attack killing at least 14 civilians was on a convoy of, uh, of vans which were taking food from the UN World Food Programme to people displaced by conflict. Meanwhile, the International Committee of the Red Cross says escalating violence in the country over the past six months has forced health workers to flee and has left more than half a million people with little or no access to health care. More than 250,000 people are now displaced because of the violence and the Red Cross says dozens of health centres have shut down in recent months. Sudan's first cabinet since the overthrow of President Omar al-Bashir in April has been sworn in. The 18 members of the cabinet, which include four women and the country's first female foreign minister, Asma Abdullah, took their oaths of office at the presidential palace in the capital, Khartoum. This comes after the setting up of a sovereign council last month, comprising of civilian and military members. Analysts say this new cabinet is faced with many challenges that need immediate solutions. It is not clear if the months of protest have produced real change. Some of the former president's key allies, including senior military personnel, still hold powerful positions in the new council. Meanwhile, talks between South Sudan's President Salva Kerr and opposition leader Rik Mashar have begun in the capital, Juba. Pictures shared on social media show a packed hall with officials from both sides as well as a delegation from the Sudanese government. The talks are aimed at reviving a stored peace agreement signed a year ago. They are to discuss last year's peace deal, which is yet to be implemented because of a lack of meetings between the former bitter rivals. The government says it does not have the funds to implement a key part of the peace deal, the demobilization and integration of former rebels into the National Army. President Kerr fell out with his then deputy, Rik Mashar, in 2013, triggering a civil war which has killed tens of thousands of people and displaced more than four million. Several attempts to bring peace have failed, including a previous attempt at a peace deal in 2015, but international pressure first them forced them back to the negotiating table. Let's bring in Naba Mohidin, VOA's correspondent in Sudan, to discuss more on this. Naba, let's start with this. How are the Sudanese people reacting to this new development? Are they hopeful that this cabinet, which has been sworn in in Sudan, will improve their lives after Omar al-Bashir's rule? happy and optimistic about the new cabinet as uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Abdullah Hamdok, put hard criteria on choosing the names of the cabinet and uh, people uh, feel happy with the choosing uh, of the technocrats and experienced uh, uh, people and also the representation uh, of women in different sovereign positions. In, for the first time in Sudan history, uh, the foreign minister is a woman and also youth and sport uh, ministry also. So people think the change uh, will be fundamental and uh, the new cabinet with the support of a uh, regional and international community um, may sustain the development and change the lives of Sudanese uh, after ousting the former president Omar al-Bashir. Well, it's pretty obvious that they most definitely have a lot of work cut out for them. But what are the immediate challenges they, are, they plan on tackling first? The first and most challenging is the economic situation because this is why people protested against Al-Bashir regime in the first place. Uh, also, the stop of the war in different regions in the country is a priority because this is a guarantee for a sustainable and a long time development. Um, and both can be built by a good relationship with the neighboring countries and international community. And this can happen with the uh, good communication with the uh, different countries and also working on lifting Sudan from U.S. sanctions in this uh, level. Uh, so the challenge are economic situation and the good relationship with neighboring countries and international communities and also uh, the stop of the war. Uh, 
this is the challenges for the new cabinet for now. Now, but just finally, just before I let you go, what uh, more details can you give us about this meeting between neighbouring South Sudan's leaders, uh, Rik Mashar and Salva Kerr? Talks that will take place this evening is an extension for talks that took place in Ethiopia and Cairo, but it fell down. Uh, but uh, people uh, put great hopes that this time will be uh, successful. The talks will be successful. And it's an uh, initiative by President Silva Kiir to boost and support peace process and talks and agreements in Northern Sudan between armed forces uh, and revolutionary front and the current uh, newly formed cabinet uh, because uh, the reason of the war uh, is not uh, is no longer here, which is the former regime. So uh, people and political parties put very great hopes on this talk and uh, maybe it will make uh, the uh, wanted uh, rapprochement that was awaited for at least 30 years. All right, VOA's Naba Mahidin speaking to us there from Khartoum. Meanwhile, in South Sudan, about 800 national and international peacekeepers have been deployed along one of Juba's main city streets in a cleanup effort meant to collect close to 1,700 trash bags destined for Juba's main dump site. This is the second main cleanup campaign effort that borrows from Rwanda's Umuganda cleanup tradition, which sees a handful of shopkeepers edge out of their shops to clean a little outside their premises. Joining in the cleanup effort, head of UN Miss David Scherer praised the efforts of the peacekeepers. Managing garbage is important for human health, so what we're trying to do is making sure that we contribute to the city's effort in cleaning the city to prevent diseases, prevent environmental pollution. So it's really our effort, our contribution to support the city in uh, ba basically uh, improving the uh, state of the environment here. I just wanted to say thank you for your contribution. It's very important that we are not just seen to be driving around in cars, but we're actually working with the people and helping the people of South Sudan. To our South Sudanese that all of them, they should come out and should join us to do cleaning. It is not our responsibility alone or it is not the responsibility of the UN. It is our collective responsibility to clean our city so that each and everyone which is coming to South Sudan will know that South Sudan people are clean people. Finally, on the program, Pope Francis has arrived in Mauritius, the final stop of his three-nation tour of Southern Africa. Thousands of people flocked to the capital, Port Louis, to catch a glimpse of the leader of the Catholic Church. Pope Francis was met by Prime Minister Pravind Kumar Jugnaut, who had earlier said the pontiff would find a model of pluralism in the Indian Ocean island, a melting pot of religious and ethnic groups. Mauritius is predominantly Hindu, but about 30% of the population is Christian, mostly Catholic, and some 17% are Muslims. When, while in Madagascar, the Pope issued a stinging condemnation of the stinging condemnation of the country's failure to tackle environmental problems and inequality. He is to return to Madagascar for the night and leave for Rome on Tuesday morning. Well, that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Teniola Shibuele. Bye for now.